The Creatives with AI Podcast. The spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Dudley, thanks very much for um, saving me today because I had somebody drop out and uh, you you very nicely agreed to come on and have a quick chat with me this afternoon. So um, first of all, thanks for doing that. One last minute, Larry. <laughs> okay. And um, just before we get started, um, we'll, we'll do the traditional podcast thing. So if you can tell everybody listening, just give them a little bit about who you are and what your background is so they kind of understand what, where you're coming from. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Dudley Neville Spencer, um, Chief Innovation Officer at an integrated agency, marketing agency called Live and Breathe, and also co-founder of the Virtual Influencer Agency, which I will explain more about later, I'm sure. But by way of background, I actually started off in life back when I was uh, just 20, working for a, a US investment bank where I was a a trader for and a, a futures trader for eight years, including in the in the pit where you shouted each other with funny hand signals and everything. But more importantly than that, that's kind of where I fell in love with machine learning and uh, and data and patterns within data because the job more than anything else was to try to understand fear and greed um, through looking at patterns, <laughs> and that morphed you know into moving into advertising because uh, I thought that would be more creative. Uh, and from there, moving into um, research and using, uh, starting to try and use machine learning in around 2015, 2016 to try and understand humans and psychology and how that could help create better ads, better copy, better imagery. And then founding the Virtual Influencer Agency in uh, in 2017 with the belief that with the advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence, we would be able to create characters that brands could own that would have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with consumers uh, and that that would morph into sort of CRM systems and virtual assistants as one great big unit, which has taken longer than I thought it would, but that's what's starting to happen now. And is now moving faster than you expected it to once it got started. Yeah, yeah, but but still, still not quite exploding yet for brands because of brand safety issues with gpt and and, uh, and hallucinations yeah. and streaming costs and all that kind of stuff yeah of course and i know before we we actually got on the call there were a couple different areas that you had said that you might want to talk about that you were working on um which the two of them were trying to help streamline the creative process um, in agencies, but more from an operational standpoint, which is, I think, something that's really interesting because that's what we're starting to see in a lot of industries now is obviously using AI and some of the new tools to to actually to do that exact thing. So it's interesting that you were talking about that. So, so I'd love to dig into that. And also going back to what you said a minute ago about understanding people and being able to use AI to understand the psychology of humans to do that stuff. So I don't know which one of those you want to attack first. Yeah, I think the the operational AI is, is really interesting. So the focus has kind of been up to date uh, from, um, from an AI point of view, trying to uh, use language analysis and sort of meta language analysis to understand the emotions of different target audiences. And then from that, figure out what their psychology is and therefore what kind of ads or words or images or stories you should tell to generate awareness or consideration or loyalty. So if someone's neurotic, you know, show them an image uh, uh, of a bunch of people having fun. So they think they're missing out <laughs> at its simplest. <laughs> you know, if there's someone that, you know, is full of um, agreeableness, then show them a, a bunch of people sort of, you know, happy together or cheers in, you know, that's going to attract them at its basis. Yeah. yeah. So that's from the research uh, point of view. And th that then sort of moved into creative intelligence. So trying to generate multiple images, words and stories quickly so that you can create, um, you know, really good pitches or really good what used to be scamps, which is what our creative division at, at Live and Breathe are, are doing now. And it just helps you visualize the ideas a lot faster and also generate more ideas. Still not at the point where you can perfect that and just have an output of an ad, even if it's on social. If you do, it's very, very simple, way too simple. So we're not there yet, but it really helps with that creative process and something that you talk about an awful lot, which is collaboration with the AI and the human. Uh, but where 
I'm starting to move now, and uh, whereas an agency we're starting to move at Live and Breathe is using rags to try and retrieve assets, be they for the research team. So a whole, you know, thousands of documents, asset documents of research from you know, 30 years of, of research work. Um, and there's thousands of strategic routes or creative routes in your server. So getting the machine to find the relevant ones for you, package them together, summarize them and say, right, here's a bunch of stuff we've done before. Let's use this to stimulate the next pitch or the next brief or the next piece of work. Yeah. So that's much more operational. And as a an AI product developer, the goal you're always looking for is to take a job um, create a benchmark so job x takes hour y and then when you put the ar tool on it job x takes hour y minus 50 percent <laughs> and so what that tool is really looking to do is try and reduce pitch time briefing time uh and right. creative time interesting and just for the people who don't know can you explain what rags means yeah, it's like asset retrieval. So um, at its really, at its simplest, if you think of, uh, and what we're really talking about here is an interface where you get to talk, for example, with a GPT, and then it goes off as an agent. So it's doing something uh, for you uh, as a, you know, as an, as an agent of you, and it's going off and finding things in multiple servers, which it thinks are going to be useful for you. So it's asset retrieval, but it's a machine retrieving the assets for you. So at its simplest, instead of typing into that little um, search icon on Windows or something, so um, non-alcohol analysis and hoping that it pulls something up, it's like talking to your very own uh, data analyst and saying, go and find me everything on that. And it goes into all your servers and it pulls it all out for you and it summarizes it all for you. And it also scales it in what it thinks is order of relevance. And because you've got a GPT on top of it, it talks to you and it can communicate with you. So it's faster because of that interaction. Which is amazing. And I th I want to say I've got, I found, saw an article last night talking about rags around AI. And I think the context of that was something that I've talked about probably for the last year, which is I think the, the model they were talking about was more like a federated model. So what you had is you have like a controlling AI, and if you ask it to play chess, yeah. it doesn't try and play chess itself. It uses an API connection to go to a chess AI, yeah. Yeah. and then it brokers the conversation. And it's a, it's the similar type of thing. It's able to go out to other sources to get a specialist in that area or to look for data across the systems and stuff. So That's I'm literally just, just sharing that on LinkedIn today. But yeah, it's really interesting. That's a much more complex version, and that is where we're going. But even the, the so the version I was talking about before is is actually rags within your own system within your own file network. But actually, it's really difficult to do. That hasn't been nailed yet. So again, you know, it's always this thing where we're looking at the exciting stuff of it, but when actually it comes down to operational, does it work? So we'll talk about uh, the, the agents pulling information from uh, other GPTs or other agents, uh, but. If you keep it really simple and you just talk about trying to pull information from your own servers to actually make it work properly, you really still need someone to tag everything with metadata. <laughs> and so if you've got 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 documents, somebody still has to go through it because you can use clustering uh, algorithms um, to try and look at the words within each of the documentation and then come up with its own taxonomy or you can give it k you know you can give it taxonomy so yeah. 30 different topics so if you're an advertising agency and, it might be, and fit it into one of these boxes right. yeah to, to find uh you know nearest fit into one of these topics and put it in there but guess what it's not perfect it doesn't work <laughs> so to make it work really really well you still need a human to go in there and it's like that with all ai at the moment right it, it, what you see out there on um, advertised as product, when you actually get into the weeds of trying to implement it as a business, there's still an awful lot of intricate work that you need to do to make it perfect. And when you've got a business, it's got to be perfect, right? Um, you can't have it pulling in a bunch of research or strategy or ideas from, um, you know, car research and implementing that into 
research about non-alcoholic beer because it's going to mess the whole thing up. So yeah, yeah, you still need someone. No, it's this. no, it's a great point, and it's getting better and better every day. And it's in my experience, it's it's way better at doing that type of task than it is at doing a lot of other types of tasks. Um, so it it's it's still if you point it at something and ask it a question about what it sees, it's much better at analyzing that. Yeah. than potentially hallucinating something that if you just ask it an open-ended question. But um, And there was something else I wanted to go back to that you mentioned. When you were talking about understanding psychology and you were talking about you know people of different personality types, mm -hmm. how easy or difficult is it to work that out from looking at people's profiles from an advertising standpoint? Because if you're yeah, I'll just leave it at that. How how easy or difficult is it to do that? So the first thing is, you know, it's not perfect, right? Uh, it's really signposts pointing you in a direction, which is much better than not having any signposts, right? Um, if you find, if you've identified really good target audiences and then you can scrape their language from social um, and you've cleaned out all the bots, and you cleaned out all the brands, which again, you kind of have to do manually to get it to really work. So it's the same thing. You can get the machine to pull it all in, what we call the machine qualified data, but then you still need a human. So one of our team in the research division, Live and Breathe, you, you still need one of them to go through it and go, yeah, right person, yeah, right person, yeah, right person. So we like to try and get a thousand to two thousand of those individuals. All of them are anonymized, so the client will never ever see who they are. And in our systems, no, we don't need to, so we never see who they are. It doesn't matter. Um, but then you go analyze their language. Now, from all of the research we've done and we've seen, if you can get about 5,000 words of someone chatting, you really do understand them. And it's just the nature of human language that the way we talk is really an expression of our psychology, and you can't get away from it unless you're making a concerted effort to pretend to be someone or something else. And if you do that, then yeah, it doesn't work. But most people uh, on social absolutely don't do that. <laughs> then you tag to that, you know, what interests they're in, uh, what accounts they've engaged with, what content they've shared, and you start to get this incredibly accurate map of who they are. So the way we work is we will... <clears throat> Let's say we're in a category, fizzy drinks. We'll find people who have talked about purchasing fizzy drinks. So you know that they are a category participant. Then you extract 1,000, 2,000 of them in each different territory, and then you run your analysis to understand their psychology. And you're looking for massive over or under indexing in terms of psychology, and then you create the, the copy and the imagery around those over or under indexes. And it, it, it works very well, very nicely. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I worked for a company back in the early 2000s that targeted um, website content dynamically based on the behavior of the person on the website during that session. Absolutely. And you could get 40% uplift that's on, yeah, on certain... Con that's amazing, yeah. isn't it? That's amazing. Yeah. You know, what are they there for? You know, And then give it to them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it was... It actually... We worked with an airline. I won't say which airline specifically, but we worked with an airline. We got 44% uplift on people booking extras like rental cars and hotels and, and, and transfers and all that sort of stuff. And at, they ended up turning it off because it was outperforming other parts of the business. And the people in the other parts of the business essentially got angry because they now weren't the best performing part. And, and they forced them politically internally. They had to turn it off. It's a great story. <laughs> that is a great story. So now you could attach that to some generative content on web, right? So not just pulling it from afar, but actually generating it on the fly yeah. and, and presenting it. Yeah. Brilliant. I love which, it. Let's do it. Which, yeah, which was, I mean, which is crazy that, mm. you know, that you can do that. And I don't think a lot of people realize that all the stuff that happens in the background mm -hmm. <laughs> and has done, you know, that was, that was just simple, you know, behavioral analysis. And we were doing some predictive modeling. Mm -hmm. We'd go in and do a big study. We'd figure out which variables were predictive. And then you could just target people based on that. It was, it was really, really simple. But like you said, now with the new tools, you could start a conversation. You can dynamically create stuff if you could be confident that it wouldn't go completely off the reservation and just start doing something crazy. Yeah, and, and that's the trick, right? That that kind of brings us to the to the virtual humans thing, you know, which is 
uh, okay, so let's say you want to get them into your system. Uh, you want to create a relationship with them. You know, you want to get them onto that website, talking to a, a virtual assistant or whatever. Before that happens, um, how do you create awareness? You know, by ads or, you know, by virtual influencers, you know, by a character that a brand owns that lives on social uh, and represents the brand but has a backstory. So it's like a, like an entertainment concept. Um, and there isn't a lot of it happening, but there is a whole ton of interest and a whole load of uh, discovery projects going on because it really feels like brands have woken up to the fact that at some point you're going to be able to generate very quickly characters. You're going to be able to ask a GPT to have a particular personality and communicate with a particular personality and our social feeds are going to be full with generated characters, uh, which we think everything should be watermarked so you know who owns it and um, if it's made by a creator to earn money or if it's a representative of a real human or if it's owned by a brand. Um, but that if you create one as a brand, then every single follow you have uh, is a bit of data you own as opposed to using a traditional influencer where you don't own any of that. And all you're trying to do is get that influencer to, to, to point to, you know, to your website or to, uh, to your channel and hope that some of the followers come along. Whereas if you create your own character, you own all of them. And GPTs can really help with that conversation, but they still at the moment need uh, moderation. But you can have much better, much quicker, much cheaper conversations with multiple people going on at once with just one person community managing and just authorizing 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 so that's where yeah. it's at at the moment and that does yeah. really work and there's there's a couple of really famous examples of that aren't there there's a couple of virtual influencers that have i've seen in the news i don't remember specifically which ones they were but they they tend to be women in in my uh, memory mm -hmm. and um and some of them have millions of followers it's crazy yeah yeah so there are loads of virtual influencers owned by creators that have done really really well um ima.gram is a really great one over in japan i m m a dot gram g r a m if you have a look at her she's really good because She's done lots of really big brand collaborations with brands like Ikea and Apple and, and all kinds and has lots of interaction with the audiences, et cetera. Really great engagement rates, really nice content, um, really great character. And years ago, when I used to talk about this, people used to say, oh, I'd never talk to a robot. You know, it's just crazy. And now, of course, no one says that anymore. <laughs> I've not said that to us for about six months, <laughs> but there were... These articles that we used to do, like in Ad Week and everything, and it would be like us against, you know, like the the editor or whatever, you know, I'll never talk to a robot. Well, this is why you will talk to a robot. But yeah, that conversation's yeah. gone, thank yeah. goodness. But Immigram, Immigram's a, a, a really good one to look at. But there are also a number of brands that have started their own characters. So um, in France, Brittany have created their own character, which talks all about the coast and the food, really lovely, lovely character, or, uh, which you know then communicates in text on Instagram and on other channels. And there's a lot of those coming out now. Uh, and that is, that is what has just started to take off. What we're trying to do is create virtual influencers on social, but then use that as the awareness part of the funnel get them onto the website and then have that character on the site as the virtual assistant. Of course, the personality is then shrunk. You don't, you don't want them talking in full personality because at that point they're fully representing the company and really it's customer service at that point. Um, and also at that point, you know, you're not, you know, you're, you're chatting more about product, not about general life, but that is a really good, funnel from awareness to consideration um, all the way to, to purchase and, and loyalty. And that's what we're trying to connect at the moment. And that's what a lot of companies and big companies are really interested in and doing tests in. Interesting. So how do you, where do you see this going over the next, you know, sort of five or 10 years? I mean, is it, are we going to get to the point 
and I know everybody talks about this and, and I've said loads of times that I would love to have a personal assistant that I could, that would essentially be a real virtual assistant that could do, actually do things for me. But do you think that's as a, as a brand or an organization, you know, are we just going to have somebody like that who, instead of having a chat box down in the corner, it's actually going to be the picture of a person and there's going to be an avatar and you'll just be able to chat with the avatar and it will be able to just do everything that way? Yeah, there's a load of of issues with that. A, a, there's a lot of companies that tell you that you can you can already do it, but you it, you can't do it easily, and you can't do it with brand safety yet. It's very close though. So I think what you'll see is it's always iterations, right? So the the first thing is at the moment, right now, through a nice uh, text chat, you can get decent conversation, which is very brand safe within effectively like a conversation tree. Certain subjects are fully safe and fully automated. If you go outside of that, then you probably need a human to come in. So I think <clears throat> that's where we are at the moment. Very soon, and we are we are actively doing this, there are a couple of things such as booking tickets, um, booking restaurants, buying things where the only component which you, David, would have to do when you ask this particular company and this avatar agent to do it for you, the only time you'll have to hit the keyboard is when you have to put in your little password for your credit card. So we're, that that point is happening right now, and you're gonna you will start to see some of those come up. I would like to think within uh, properly with some big companies, some small companies doing, but big companies in the next three to six months. So a few functions being done for you. Um, However, when it comes to are you able to chat to the character and it looks at you and it chats back to you. So the problems there, of course, are we can convert the text, which the GPT comes up to, into lip syncing relatively straightforwardly. But there is always a streaming cost to do that because it takes a lot of compute with a GPU to convert that text onto a rigged face and make it say it on the fly quickly. It's just, it just costs a lot. So with quantum computing coming in, I think you'll be able to do that and it will fly. But access to quantum computing and costs at the moment is still too small and too big. So we're not there yet. So I yeah. think that's within the next three years um, when, when that starts to happen. But then that brings in the whole question about power consumption, because of course, GPTs suck up so much power and so much water and so much energy. I mean, I'm hoping we bring on some fusion tokamaks soon and have unlimited energy. Exactly. And that's not a problem. Exactly. <laughs> well, I have a question on that, just not to distract, but building on the quantum thing. So I've said for a long time that I think quantum is going to be the next major leap really? in AI. And we probably won't get to a true AGI until we have sure. a workable quantum computer. But nobody ever seems to talk about that. So it's interesting that you brought that up. And secondly, do you, I don't know this, but do you have any idea what the power is like on a quantum computer as opposed to a normal one? Because would we get a thousand or a million times the processing power for the same amount of electrical power that would need it be needed, or does it need massive amounts of electrical power? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if you do either. Yeah, when it comes to power per output, I couldn't give you an answer on that. I, I don't know. Um, I just know more about the uh, speed of compute and the, yeah. the volume yeah. of actions. So I'll, I'll take that away for the audience as an action point, and I will um, put it in the show notes if I could figure it out. It's a really good one to look at, isn't it? Because, you know, you always like to look at things in, you know, three or ten year time frames. And I think, you know, three years we will have lots of interaction going on, but um, it's not going to be ubiquitous everywhere until we get that quantum thing coming, which is probably five to ten years. So yeah, it's always that thing, isn't it, where you have the technology, but then you also need the, the power, you need the distribution, you need the adoption. And so we might actually have the technology almost right now, but we don't have those other things to make it all work. Um, yeah. But at a stripped down version, which could really affect CRM and improve uh, awareness, um, consideration of sales, yeah, we've got that now at a stripped down version. It just needs to be implemented properly. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's, it feels like, yeah, like you said, and it also feels to me like a lot of that stuff is going to happen around the same time. Mm. Like, you know, I mean, our generation has seen, 
well, I'm assuming you're around my age, but our generation has seen everything from going from black and white TVs to now having AI. Yeah. And we'll probably, if we're lucky, we'll all still be around when we have, you know, when we have essentially unlimited power, we'll have AGI, we'll have all these things. Well, quantum computing, it'll all just be all at, at the same point. And it, it's going to be like a crazy 10 year period when all these technologies are coming out and they're, they're all going to figure out how, how to work together. And it's, it, I mean, I get it's equally scary and equally exciting at the same time, but if yeah. we can manage to do good with some of it, it could be incredible. Yeah. I, I have, I'm always an optimist, but, but I'm a realist at the same time. And I completely agree that you're going to get this coalescence. I also think you're going to get, an AI push back and you kind of started to see it. You, know, you get the hype and then you get people saying, well, I'm not using it. No, I mean, it hasn't changed my life, even though it's like affecting absolutely everything. You're going to get a bunch of that for a while, for sure, because you always do. Um, but where I'm hopeful is that unlike the last leap when we had the internet and then social, there was no regulation, right? And we messed that up so badly with such dire, dire consequences that we're feeling today with disinformation and young people suffering so much with the fracturing of of groups and society um, be because of the way we messed that up with no regulation, that you're seeing an awful lot of regulation now with AI and you're seeing politicians competing to be at the front of the regulation curve, which traditionally I wouldn't have liked, but actually for this, I think it's brilliant, you know, and you've got everyone involved. You've got China involved, you've got the US involved, you've got, you know, the AI uh, summit, which I really liked the way the UK is approaching it, you know, which is really about outsized negative effects. And then the way Europe's approaching it is completely different, which is just about thousands of laws, which individual ones, which we need. And then the US is completely different, which is, well, we're going to motivate you by saying, if you want any government contracts, <laughs> you have to do this, this and this. Otherwise, you can't get any of our billions, which is also really needed. So and then the thought about licensing GPTs, you know, and if somebody uses it without a license, they get it's great. It's really, really good. Will it be enough? I'm not sure. But I'm very hopeful. And we're certainly in a place for this next step, which we've never been in before, with more awareness from politicians and more awareness from the public who are demanding it. So I'm hopeful. And slightly personal question, do you have kids? Yeah. What do you, how do you feel about the future that they're moving into? Cause yeah. I have, I have kids as well. I have a 17 year old son and you know, it's a crazy, it's a crazy world that he's trying to move into and trying to help him understand, you know, what skills he might want to have or what direction he might want to take is pretty confusing at the minute. Yeah, it is really confusing because it moves so quickly. So, you know, I've, I've got, uh, two, uh, two, two children, um, 10 and six, and so for them, I probably would have been advising them on something a little bit different a few years ago, um, where similar but different. So a few years ago, it was all about uh, kind of world creation. And the theme is always creativity, right? So using tools to aid creativity, right? But with, with a human touch. So whatever happens in the future humans and them having a relationship and stories to tell other people will be incredibly important um and so what i've always done what we've always done as a family is encourage our children to be as creative as possible and to develop their own uh, worlds and their own characters which they love doing and you're going to have a, a future i think where attribution of an idea from an individual is going to be really important um we're kind of built that way yes that human can use a machine to help them come up with the idea but in the same way that tolkien created a world you know that's kind of what we kind of teach our kids um and that whatever the tools are that you're going to end up using to perpetuate and build these worlds um that doesn't matter We'll just use them as they come in. It's all about experimentation. But having them think 
creatively um, is what we've always encouraged in song, in word, in story, in character. Um, yeah, that's been our that's been our focus, and they're, and they're both very creative, and they love all that, so it's it's good. <laughs> Brilliant. I think that's very well said, and that feels like a really good jumping off point for the conversation as well, because I also know you've got a hard stop. So, um, Dudley, thank you very much again. That was a that was a really good conversation. I enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, love your podcast too, and thank you for having last minute Larry on. Really, really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And I'll put show links to all the stuff and 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 your companies and, and everything else that we talked about as well. But yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks very much. And we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Creatives with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. curious.